I knew they had become what a journal because things have grown so much. I didn't know that this time will impact that so many more. Um, airflow operators need to die. Um, my day is over 100. And it quickly grew to over 200. I actually asked ChatGPT and Bart to actually tell, tell me the number. They said, they said 100 plus. Um, no, that sounded like not so, not so correct anymore after looking at some of the data. And then I was obviously talking to people within this room and outside of this room, and they've mentioned 200. Other people have mentioned 800. Um, but if you go to the astronomy registry, you get to 1,541 which is a really large number. And we actually do that, you know, we provide those packages to you within the provider packages where it's around 80 plus, kind of. Maybe there are more, could also be, you know, with the 1500, 80 plus, that might, uh, might uh, not that. Obviously, there is a, it's kind of the unique selling point of Airflow as well. So if there's another Airflow killer around, just look at what their integration capabilities are and then suddenly you think, okay, maybe not, because they do not you know, allow that kind of integration capability. Um, nevertheless, it does take a lot of effort for us to meet it. Um, we do have a separate CI CD infrastructure thread. We do have a separate field pipeline thread. Um, and we have a separate, within these Apache Airflow uh, type things, and we need to both separately and first it's separate to the release cycle first, which is great on the consumer end, obviously. Um, but nevertheless, on the community side, it creates quite a burden of doing it. And I know, I don't know if Yarek is in the room, and he's very diligently always pushing for this and with a lot of people around it. I really command you for that. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and it's great. However, 1541 packages uh, is, uh, is uh, or uh, sorry, operators is quite a lot. Um, then there's another question. What are the most used error operators in Airflow? Python operator. Python operator. Oh, that's an easy answer. What's the second most used operator? No, bash operator. I heard the bash operator. Very good. Bash operator is correct. Um, so yes, indeed, Python operator and bash operator. Astronomer says it's around 90 or over 90% is the Python operator or the best operator. Um, Google says it's about 50%. I leave it to the audience to guess what the other operators are, which are then being used by Google. And Amazon says it's like kind of a little bit more, it's a bit of more, more broader spectrum. Um, it's also good to know that the task flow wraps the functions into Python operators mostly. Um, but it does indicate that most of the users are running custom code, and code that does not fit within an operator, or they just wrap anything what they already have and just wrap that within either the bash operator or the Python operator, um, and uh, do that in Airflow, and so they can orchestrate these tasks. Maybe we'll just sprinkle it with some other operators around it, but let's say the long tail might be very long, but with 1541, um, then, uh, then I assume that most of them will be used by one person only because that was the guy who submitted it, or the girl, by the way. Uh, the, the person that submitted it to, uh, to Airflow and then it became maintained. Great stuff. For that person, it became, you know, we pushed it up. Um, so the question is, so do we then spend a lot of effort on operators that are actually mostly unused? Well, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm going to assume yes, because I don't know who looked at the last, you know, the long tail of those operators and what changes we made to them in the past. Most of them are documentation updates, like fixing a comma somewhere or making sure that they adhere to the new style of what we do with operators. I've looked at the Facebook operator, for example, and hasn't been updated significantly in the last two years. I don't know if it still works. I know for some of those operators that they definitely don't work anymore or that we can't test them because they require a commercial account to actually be able to test them. So that's kind of tough. So is it then smart to keep those question mark or do we do other stuff with it? 
There are also other issues. You cannot use operators within task flow defined functions. That's kind of goes against the principle currently, but think about if you're a data scientist, and we'll come back to it a little bit later, your way of working is a bit more linear, notebook style kind of thing, and you would not be able to integrate that easily. You need to restructure your code to actually make it work. And that is tough because nobody wants to adjust their way of working just to make it fit within a framework. That's the most annoying thing you can do and you lose customers, users because of it. Um, then we have kind of a big O problem too because we suddenly have like a myriad of operators that are called Hive to MySQL, MySQL to Hive, Vertica to Hive, Glacier to GCS, GCS to Glacier most likely, so X to Y and Y to X. That creates, again, like, and, and interestingly enough, you would assume, because that was kind of, if you would have looked at what, why did we do operators, that there's a kind of standardization around it. Um, you know, how those operators would function. They don't, that's the spoiler, you probably know it. Uh, you need to look most likely into the code because the documentation is not, you know, for those 1,541 operators to be well done. Unfortunately, and I'm, you know, it's there, and we can all fix it. Eh? You provide a PR, and the documentation is there somewhere, but there seems to be no need for it either. Glad it's open source. You can always look at it, and you can, you know, improve it if you want. But I wonder if people actually. Thirdly, it's hard to capture lineage from operators. I don't know if you looked at the opera or the lineage code. Um, it was already in the past, and I think uh, Julian also knows it because we have talked about it in the past too. Um, you need to have an extractor for more or less every single operator to extract the details that you'd like you know, in a lineage on the lineage side, which kind of makes us explode everything around it again. So that is really, really, really not something you would like to continue. It becomes like a kind of, I don't know, a Frankenstein thing. <laughs> I don't know if you call it that. Um, but I think we can do better and we should do better as a, as a community and as a project to make sure that we are you know, ready for the future and also maintainable towards the future. Um, uh, however, by, by the way, you will see, we've seen improvements on the linear side by having the SQL operators, for example, deriving from the base SQL operator and saying they, they are duplicated to the system directly. Um, I think there is an improvement there and I think that's kind of an example which you could use for um, uh, for other operators as well. So meet Marcos, I, I think I've talked about it uh, already a little bit. Um, Marcos is the one-man army, data scientist and lead, lives and breathes notebooks. Um, and he works for an, an auction company and he deals with lots. Uh, auctions obviously hammer value, hammer value, um, net, uh, net, uh, net sale value and a gross uh, sale value. Uh, and I've looked into the auction business a little bit uh, earlier and it's interesting that, uh, that the highest bid is mm, doesn't have to be the winner bid, for example. It's very interesting things that are happening in that auction business. Um, and he, but like I said, he is a one man army. That means there is no engineering capacity you know, in his data team. He is the data team, um, meaning that he also he's, he needs to be a polyglot. However, if you think about what he, uh, uh, and this is an actual thing, I think, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Marcos. Um, his, his, he lives and breathes in notebooks, and this is this from Databricks, obviously. Um, and uh, how do you then restructure this in a way that is easy for him to understand? Because he looked at Azure Data Factory, for example, and he worked with that. But it was tough to orchestrate things properly. Um, and then you know, he heard about a thing called Airflow. Nowadays in uh, Azure Data Factory, you can actually click Airflow on and it starts working. Um, oh, you said five minutes? Oh, I need to be faster. Um, then uh, then, uh, then uh, you understand that he has a challenge. I'll skip forward a little bit faster. So rethinking the operator, and maybe you have guessed the subtitle of my talk, it's long live the operator. 
um, but I had you as a teaser with operators need to die, obviously. So thank you for that. <laughs> Here you go. Um, but we need to rethink the operator a little bit because wouldn't it be nice if operators could deal with file-like objects residing anywhere so that the Glacier to GCS operator become and every other transfer operator could just become copy file object or preferably having any Python tooling be able to just execute what they need to do. Because I know that my friends from astronomer will say, hey, universal transfer operator, yeah, something like that. But that's kind of a slap on kind of thing. It's not integrated with the rest of the ecosystem. Um, so, and preferably if you are in task flow, you would like to do your generic uh, Python things on top of what Airflow then provides as an underlaying framework, rather than that you need to go out of task flow, do something with your operator, go back into task flow, uh, and then do something with it. If we would do that, we could capture lineage at the same time, because then suddenly we can generalize everything, and we just capture it from one place, and uh, Julian and his uh, open lineage team suddenly have to do a lot less effort to make this work. But also, wouldn't it be nice that task flow and operators would be truly integrated. Um, because currently, you cannot execute an operator within, the, within a task flow context. Well, why not? Why are we doing it? That's a kind of an engineering view on how we think your code needs to be structured. But if you think about linearly how a data scientist would execute, he might be, a, or he would like to do that in a way, or he or she, uh, would, do, uh, would like to do that in a way that those things get executed in a task just under the hood. So could, couldn't we do something like that? Instead of using a hook where we lose all the effort that we spend inside operators to make them work, um, with where we just have a thin wrapper around a, a connection. Um, and again, talking to Maxime earlier, that's a side note, um, the hooks were initially created with the idea that much more logic would go into the hook and the operator would be much more alike. Um, however, uh, we as community decided to run the other way um, and unfortunately then we're stuck with this situation. Um, so it would be great to have, to really integrate task flow and operators instead of having them like in separate worlds inside Airflow because that's what they currently are. Or, and wouldn't it be nice if all operators, or the ones that are relevant, actually know how to deal with data frames? Data frames being the de facto standard for data manipulation nowadays, in one way or another, structured data, I would say, um, uh, or tabular if you'd like, but most of, we, but most of the time what we do is you know, get some unstructured data and put it into a table. We have the 80% of use cases covered. Um, and, uh, and Daniel knows that because he created the Astro SDK, obviously doing that kind of thing, closely related to that. Um, and make sure that Airflow understands how to pass them between the different tasks. If we make all operators understand them, we could just provide the glue between the data stores. We don't have to you know, have those separate things anymore. We just provide the glue. Instead of that, we do two endpoints, we provide the edge. Um, that would remove the need for data store X to data store Y operators. If you think about that, it would reduce the number of operators by about 70%. Splitting non-data operators, splitting up a cluster, which you need to do is not very much data aware and you probably can't gen over generalize that easily. And data operators, we, we could generalize. Um, it, would, would you, it would actually improve maintainability, standardization, security, and reliability significantly. And probably our family's lives too, because we suddenly have a mo lot more free time too. Um, and then you would say, and again, my friends of Astronomer would probably say, hey, the Astro SDK is covering this for quite an extent. Yes, you're right, you had a great idea. It's awesome. 
um, it would just be even more awesome if we would put it into the core of Airflow and also embrace it in a way that it's in the core of the Airflow. Currently, it's a bit of a slap on thing, meaning that we need to re-implement quite a lot of things on the site of the SRO SDK because they're not inside the hooks, for example, or not available in those areas. I think that could be improved. But other people like a Buses co-author, uh, Julian, has implemented about two, three years ago, how long was it again, uh, long ago? Four, <laughs> four years ago even. Um, something like they go up like a, uni a way of composable operators where we had the sync and source kind of construction for, uh, uh, for, the, for the different operators. So you could do, you could do those copies in a generalized way. It wasn't proposed as a PR to the project, um, but I do think that there is lessons to be learned and simplicity to be have ahead um, to have something like that in place. And it re re would make our lives better. Um, so my argument for today is let's embrace and extend. Let's embrace and extend what Daniel has created, what Jim and what, uh, what Daniel has created and what other people have created and start, you know, integrating, um, in this case, partially the Astro SDK in a way that we might get a call, something called a blob API. I don't know if there's probably a better name for it, but think of like standardized file access across operators, across operators and task flow, that we get a really great data frame API that allows us to have structured data manipulation. And then finally, we start removing those unneeded operators. And I, this is a call out to our uh, friends from, uh, from Google, Amazon, and eventually Microsoft and Astronomer as well. Share a little bit more details about the usage so we can, as a community, can focus our effort where we need it. And therefore, you know, get rid of some of the effort that we don't like to spend so much. Um, so that we um, have even better airflow than we until now have. So we can do something like this. So we can do something like this. You have an execute for in an operator and that delivers back something nil, a file or a data frame. We have a hook that implements the blob API and therefore we can use the standard utilities of, of, uh, of Python just to copy from the source to the destination. I, have hope, I hope that I've uh, instilled you with some inspiration you didn't find the controversy that I instilled initially <laughs> too much. Um, and you see, a, uh, uh, I hope I've, as, a, as a community, I've pushed you to a direction that, uh, that I hope uh, will work uh, to the watch the future. If you want to look at what was created in the past or is still being worked on, um, the airflow provider transfers, I'm not sure uh, on the astronomer side if it's still being worked on because the latest release was a long time ago. Um, the SROSDK is still in development, obviously. Airflow FS is not in development anymore, but you'll get some inspiration out of it. Thank you so much. You can reach me uh, if you have any questions on uh, that email address or uh, in the audience right now, if there's still time left, uh, uh, Daniel. All right, thank you so much, Bokeh.